Okay, in this video, I'd like to take you through a few of the examples that you've seen here in the assignment for practicing non-digital measurements. And I just kind of talk through a few examples now that we've gone over how you look at a device in terms of its markings and determine how precise your measurements are allowed to be. So when we look at a device like a graduated cylinder, which is probably our most common non-digital measuring device uh, in the chemistry lab, um, graduated cylinders can come in all ranges of precisions. The pictures that you see on here may or may not represent actual graduated cylinders. You won't find, for example, graduated cylinders that have uh, markings of the nearest tenth, like on the second picture here, 1.1, 1.2. You're not going to find a graduated cylinder with that sort of precision, but you might find a volumetric pipette with that kind of precision. And the same things that apply to a, a, a graduated cylinder would apply to a volumetric pipette. Where you'd look at the bottom of the meniscus, you'd need to have it at eye level, keeping it kind of nice and straight, getting your eye at that at the meniscus and making those measurements the same way. So the kind of ideas of a graduated cylinder and related devices, a burette and so on, um, all come through as we look at these pictures too. Uh, on the back side of this or the second side, you see pictures with things where we might, might not have a liquid involved at all. So reading um, something like a ruler or a meter stick, uh, even a thermometer where the liquid inside doesn't really have a meniscus necessarily. And we're able to look just sort of at how far up the liquid in that non-digital thermometer goes. Um, in your lab experience, you may or may not have worked with non-digital thermometers as well as regular digital thermometers. Both of them have their advantages. Digital thermometers are, are amazing these days and kind of the, the go-to standard anymore because they're so quick and they're very consistent. They don't need a lot of extra calibration or anything either. So they're, they're pretty great devices. But we're just gonna go through some examples and sort of show you how measurements can lead to uh, conclusions and some things that we'll do with, with calculations based on our measurements. So looking at this first one, this first picture, we wanna recognize that the line here, the main division is 12, and the next sort of minor division right above it here is, is 12.1, right? And then this next division above it is 12.2. And I think we could all agree as we look at these pictures then that the bottom of the meniscus here, the lowest point in that meniscus is somewhere between 12.1 and 12.2. So it's it's between those two lines. So it's at least 12.1, but not, not as much as 12.2. The trick then is to recognize that, like we talked about in the, in the earlier video or earlier on, that in between 12.1 and 12.2, we need to imagine that there are 10 smaller divisions. Or also another way to think about it is that because the markings, the small minor markings on here are to the nearest tenth of a milliliter, we need to divide that by 10 and estimate our answer after dividing it by 10. We need to estimate our answer to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter, 0 0.01, to the nearest 0 0.01 milliliters. And so it needs to have two decimal places. And so that second decimal place here behind the 12.1 is what we're going to estimate. Now you might look at that space in between 12.1 and 12.2 and say, you know, that curve is definitely toward the bottom of that. It's, it's in the lower range. So whether you look at that and see 10 little divisions and you think, well, that's at about 12.12. 12.12, 12 that sounds good. You might look at it and say, well, I think it's 12.13. I might think it's 12.11. Those are all acceptable answers for this. And that's where a little bit of, of uh, cre I'll say creativity, but a little bit of flexibility comes in. 12.11 would be acceptable. 12.13 would be acceptable. 12.12, as I wrote, would be okay as well. And you would find that in the lab situation, if you were working with other people, that three of you working on a particular device might look at it, and those might be the three measurements that the three of you came up with, and they'd all be correct, and they'd all be acceptable. Now, I would say if we looked at this and said the lowest point of the meniscus, if someone in your lab group said, that's 12.18, I think they're a little bit over the top. I think they're a little bit too high on that reading. And so you'd want to be able to be somewhat flexible, but not too flexible. I would also not accept anything less than 12.1. So if you said, that's 12.10, I think you're a little low, but you're probably pretty close and probably close enough. So there's a little bit of flexibility as long as we all agree that we need to have this degree of precision to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter in this case. So if this was a graduated cylinder you're measuring in milliliters, we would have 12.12 or 11 or 13 milliliters as our, as our official reading, two decimal places. We would all agree up to 12.1. That's 12.1 something. It's the something that comes after that can vary from person to person and still be acceptable. All right, let's take a look at the second one. On this one, we have lines uh, marked here at the major divisions to the nearest tenth. The smaller divisions are to the nearest hundredth. So we're actually gonna go down to the third decimal place. The, the minor markings on this one are to the nearest 0 0.01 uh, on the smaller differences here. And so this one that's below it, this little guy right here represents 1.28. The little line that that's above it represents 1.29. And we're somewhere in between 1.28 and 1.29. So we could all agree, hopefully, that this is 1.28 something. 
And that something, again, is what you need to estimate. So because the lines are to the nearest hundredth, we're going to divide that by 10, and we're going to go to the nearest thousandth. One more decimal place finer than that. So we need that third decimal place for this to be an officially correct reading. I might look at that, reason, that, that lowest point of the meniscus and say, you know, it's pretty much right in the middle. So I might say that's 1.285. The next person might say, I think it's 1.286. Next person might say 1.287 or 1.284. Those would all be okay as long as we had three decimal places and we all agreed on the 1.28 something being the measurement we're after. Like on the last one, I think if you said 1.281, that you're probably pretty low. It's probably reading a little bit too low. Little thing that goes with this that I'll mention too, though, is if you're in a lab making measurements like this, it's important in a lab group situation that you're consistent in how you record the measurements throughout a given lab day or throughout a given lab experiment. So perhaps you disagree with your lab partner. Yours, your readings are always a little bit lower than your lab partners, or yours are always a little bit higher than your lab partners. It's important that on a given experiment, one of you sort of the, is the official measurer for your group. Because that way, if one person always reads a little bit lower or a little bit higher, that bias that's built into your own reading will, will sort of be canceled out if one person always makes the readings, right? If I make the first reading and then the last reading, then I'll be reading both of them just a little bit higher than my partner. But it'll kind of take care of itself because I'll still see the same uh, change in volume, perhaps. If I make the first reading and my, my partner makes the second reading, then if I read things a little higher and my partner reads things a little bit lower, we're going to have introduced a little bit of extra error into our, our measurements and our conclusions will be, will be somewhat flawed as a result. So it's best if one person makes the official readings for, a, for the whole lab and then maybe the next lab, the other person can make the readings. All right, number three is a lot like number... Uh, well, we haven't had one like this yet, I guess. So the main divisions are, are to the nearest 10. The smaller divisions are to the nearest 1. So we're looking here at a line that's 24. And then above it here is a line that's 25. And my reading is somewhere in between. Because 1s are my smallest measurement or my smallest graduation, I'm going to go 10 times finer. I'm going to go to the nearest 10th. So my measurement should be 24 point something. It's above 24, I think we'd, we'd agree, but not quite as much as 25. So 24 point something. I might look at it and say, that's 24.9. My partner might say, it's 24.8. You might even look at it. And this one's a, probably a little low for this, but reasonably like 25.0. Maybe I got a little different angle on it, and I think, oh, that's right on the line. I think it's a little under, but if you think it's right on the line, that's okay. You just need to make sure you say so by putting that zero in there behind. So in this case, those sort of readings would all be close enough to each other that they'd be acceptable. 24 point something is probably what most people would come up with on that one. The next one gives us a chance to do what I just mentioned. That's sort of recognize that. What if it's right on the button? What if it's right on the line? Now, I might look at this and say, uh, I think that that meniscus is right on the 42 line, like exactly on the 42. The lowest point of it is exactly at 42. So instead of just saying it's 42, I'm going to say it's exactly 42 because the same rules still apply. This is the 42 line. This is the 43 line. And because that's a difference of ones, the, the lines here are to the nearest one milliliter, I need to divide that one by 10 and show my reading to the nearest 0.1 milliliters. And so by putting a zero on the end, I'm saying to the nearest 10th of a milliliter, it's exactly 42. Now you cannot go on further and say 42.00. You can't go on and say 42.00000, like some ridiculousness. You can't do that because in this case, the device is limited to one decimal place and no more, but you should go no less either. If your partner measured 42 on here and didn't write down anything else, that's not precise enough and you're not making the most of this device. If you think it's a little bit above, 42.1 sounds good. 42.2 sounds good. Maybe your partner sees it, thinks it's one of those measurements, but you'd all have the same number of decimal places. In this case, that's one. Okay. And then number five would be here a measurement of, it looks like between 58 and 59. So maybe I read that and say that's 58.5 and maybe you're a little higher or lower. But look, the question six says, suppose measurements four and five were taken before and after putting a rock sample in the graduated cylinder. This is called the water displacement technique, right? We put some water in a graduated cylinder. Let's say I put in there the 42 milliliters of water into my graduated cylinder, so it's 42.0. And then I gently put a rock in there, so the rock will sink to the bottom of my graduated cylinder. And as it does, it will displace water upward, right? It'll force water upward. And as it does that, because the water will displace an amount of volume equal to its own volume, the water will go up an amount equal to the volume of that rock. And so I could look at it and say, well, if it started at 42 and went up to 58.5, the rock's volume is the difference between those two. 
So with, with a rock in the bottom, the graduated cylinder reads 58.5 milliliters. Take away the 42 of that that comes from the water. And by subtraction, I know that this rock then has a volume of 16.5, 16.5 milliliters, or a, a more comfortable term probably for a solid. Milliliters kind of sort of say that we're measuring a liquid or measuring even a gas sometimes. For, for a solid, we might say 16.5 cubic centimeters because that's the same thing. That's an important constant that you maybe remember, but one milliliter is always equal to one cubic centimeter. Those two things are always equal for any substances at all. Right? For, for a gas, for a solid, for a liquid, for, for water, for steel, for a rock, for a cork, for anything at all, one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. And it's not really a hard, fast rule, but I would say that generally we use a term like milliliters most for liquids. We use as cubic centimeters most when we're talking about solids and their volumes. Um, gases, actually both. Gases actually sort of work under both. I've seen gases used as cubic centimeters or as milliliters. So either way would work. Um, if you just, just so you kind of have a little bit of detail there um, in sort of why those units are both necessary, um, that's kind of why. It's mostly having to do with the states of things, but either one would be correct in either case because they're equal to each other. All right. I don't know if there's anything else too unique on this page to look at. So let's jump to the back, make some measurements on the back here. It says that we need to make some recordings here of what would be considered, say, uh, a thermometer or a meter stick or a ruler. This one has little markings, smaller markings for every one, and that would be like a thermometer. So if there was like a red uh, alcohol-filled thermometer where the, the, the alcohol sort of went up through a little tube that was in the middle or something, that's how that, that liquid would be would be measured then on a thermometer. And, and even though it's a liquid in a thermometer, there's really not much of a meniscus because it's such a fine, uh, thin tube of, of red alcohol in there that it typically doesn't have a meniscus. You don't have to look at the bottom of it when it's that case. So we just have a, an amount of, of alcohol in this temperature thermometer that went up to this point, you know, filled up to the point where A is. And so if I'm, if I'm making that measurement, I would look at A and say that that's between 13 and 14, right? Because this is our 13 line. This is our 14 line. That's a unit of one. So I need to go to the nearest 10th, uh, 10 times finer. So 13 point something, if, if I think that's right in the middle, I might say that's 13.5. And on these practice ones, I'm not doing a lot with units necessarily. Uh, because we don't always know exactly what device we're looking at. But if this were a thermometer, this would be degree, degrees Celsius or something like that. And let's say B, like my measurement here on B, that's, that's at least 30, but not, certainly not up to 31. So it's going to be it's going to be 30 point something. And if I look at that and say, oh, it's 30.2 degrees Celsius. You might disagree. You might think it's a little higher or lower, but you should have one decimal place. That's the idea. Okay. Question at the end here says, measurements A and B were taken in this solution before and after a reaction took place. So if we were measuring a before and after temperature, and we'll do this throughout the course, um, what was the change in temperature? And change in temperature, you'll see that change in temperature, and this is a formula you've probably used before, if you remember it or not, I don't know, but change in temperature is a before and after comparison, right? And usually we'll see that written as delta, which means change, and then capital T for temperature. So delta, whenever you see that, that triangle symbol, hopefully you know, and if you don't, this is a good chance to hear about it, uh, that, that means a delta. It's a Greek letter that means change in something, change in temperature in this case. So delta T is how we would sort of say that, or change in temperature, is always found as the final temperature, so TF, which is final temperature, minus the initial temperature, which is T little i. So F and I there stand for final and initial. There are other sort of abbreviations you sometimes see used, especially like in a physics situation. Um, rather than F and I, they might use different abbreviations, but this is what we'll use in chemistry. The final then, if, let's see, which one was which? It says A and B were taken before and after. So A is my, is my T initial, and B is my T final. So if I have my temperature change here, I'm looking at a measurement of 30.2 degrees Celsius at the, at the end, 13.5 degrees Celsius at the beginning, if I go to my calculator, then I can figure out how much that went up, right? I didn't pull my calculator out, but I think that one's 16.7. That looks right, degrees Celsius. So my temperature change was that it went up by 16.7 degrees Celsius. So that would be my answer for this question over here, 16.7. Now, notice if we put those in there backwards, right? If we subtracted them in the opposite order, we would get a negative 16.7. And so the change in temperature tells us not only how much the temperature changed, but which way it changed. In this case, my answer was a positive because my, my final temperature was greater, so it went up by 
If it had gone down by that amount, we would have been subtracting in the opposite direction and we'd have a negative answer. So delta T can be positive or negative, in this case, uh, positive. D and C on the next part have you kind of think about it in reverse. So in that case, D is higher than C and you should get a delta T or a change in temperature uh, that's a negative on the next part, but I won't do that one with you. Same kind of idea here for E, F, and G. It wants us to say we're making the measurements on three sides of a sort of rectangular sample, in this, in this case, a metal. And we'll be doing this with wood blocks later on in the lab. So, or maybe you've already done that lab and you haven't gotten to this homework yet. But measuring three sides of a rectangular block, or as they'd say in a math situation, a rectangular prism. So just like a box, basically, of some kind. In this case, it's a block that's made of metal. The three different sides, sort of length, width, and height or length, width, and thickness, something like that. Even depth is sometimes used. So I would say that my E here is somewhere between 2 and 2.1. And so more precisely, I would call this line right here, this is 2.0, right? And this little line right here is 2.1. Now, the, the markings on these devices usually don't say things like 2.0. But it's important that when you look at the smaller lines that you know that that's the case, right? That's 2.0 because the one above it is 2.1 and the one below it is 1.9. So that makes that line 2.0, um, even if it's not labeled quite that way. So if I have markings here to the nearest 0.1 milliliters, or not milliliters, uh, in this case it's centimeters, if that's the case, then I need to be able to estimate, take that divided by 10, right, where I was getting 10 times better, I need to be able to estimate to the nearest 0 0.0, whoops, got an extra decimal point, 0 0.01 centimeters. So my, my answer should have two decimal places is kind of what that's getting at. So this E value I would measure is 2.0 something. Maybe it's a three. You don't want to be haphazard about it, but you don't want to take all day arguing about three or four. You know, if it's, is it 03 or 02 or 04? We don't want to argue about that. Like we talked about before, those are all reasonable measurements and all acceptable. F looks like it's right around here. This is a 3.7 line and it's I think it's just a tiny whisker above it so I'm going to say that that's 3.71 cubic centimeters for that second one and as I show, showed you on one of the earlier examples if you think that it's exactly 3.7 perfectly fine um, just make sure that that you write it as 3.70 then if that's the case right so I've got my first two measurements so far and if I do my third measurement then I can come up with the volume of this cube or this this block of metal so I have a length or a width I have a height. I have two of the three dimensions. The third one is here at G, and that looks like it's somewhere between 6.3 and 6.4. So 6.3, I'm going to say that's right in the middle, and call it 5. Now notice what would happen. What if you read all three of these a little higher than I did? You'd have three slightly larger measurements in the three places that I have mine. Or if you read them a little smaller, you'd have three slightly smaller measurements than I have mine. When I put those all together at the end, that's going to mean that if you measure your sides a little bigger or a little smaller than me, you're going to end up with a volume that's a little bit larger or a little bit smaller than mine. And that's okay. There's a little bit of wiggle room in those things. As long as you've recorded your data properly and our calculation is based on our measurements, it's okay if we're a little bit different from person to person. There's that variation there. It's a little bit of artistic license that we sort of take with this. So when it asks me then for volume, when you think back to our, our uh, volume calculations that you learn in grade school or whenever it is, length times width times height. And we've measured those three sides now in our previous measurements. So we want to take 2.03 times 3.71 times 6.35 if you're using my numbers. And again, if you used your own, feel free. That's great. Um, just make sure that in the end that you write down your um, length times width times height answer for H, right? You would want to use uh, your numbers and then calculate from mine or something. So 47 point, I get 47.8. And the units on that, oh, and I wrote, you know what, guys? Maybe you caught this as I was going. I messed up. This is just centimeters, not cubic centimeters on my previous measurements, though. Each side is in centimeters. The volume itself will be in cubic centimeters, right? Because this is centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. And so my answer is centimeters cubed or cubic centimeters. And so I come up with about 47.8 cubic centimeters. There are rules and rounding values like calculations that we just did uh, when it comes to doing this in a science setting. Those rules have to do with something called significant figures. And if you uh, haven't learned about significant figures yet, uh, we'll get to it as we move through the year and do a little bit more with calculations. But it's sort of based on the idea that I look at the values that I measured, like these three numbers, and each of those has three measured digits in it, 
So my answer at the end should also have three measured, or in this case, derived digits in it. So I have three measured digits. I should at the end be able to have three digits in my answer that I come up with. So my calculator might go on and on and say things like mine does 47.823755. How much do I write down? Not all of it. It's just like calculator vomit then. We don't want to do that. There are rules to it. So for now, if, when in doubt, until you get those rules a little more comfortable, feel free to write, you know, maybe write down one extra digit. Um, I won't ding you for it at this point, but later on in the course, we'll work on toward getting to where everyone knows how to round every answer off just right. Okay. And then the last thing here on Jay says, suppose the mass of the metal sample is 343.90 grams. So the metal sample they're referring to is the one from the previous question. What is the density of the metal sample? And, and if you don't remember the formula for calculating density, you'd need to go look it up and feel free to do that, right? Density in our calculation here is always the mass of something over its volume. So mass divided by volume. You almost certainly use this in various places in your, your science and maybe even math education throughout your life. So density equals mass over volume. So if we want to find density, we would just need to divide mass by volume. And so in this case, they're telling us the mass, 343.90. Where'd they get that? Probably from an electronic balance that has a digital display. So that's not on this page, right? A digital display just boop, pops it out for you. 343.90, you just write it down. You don't have to think about it too hard. Whereas with volumes, you have to think about it. Or with side lengths, with a measurement, you have, to, you have to think about it. Our volume that we just found on the previous question, I got 47.8. Okay, So 47.8 cubic centimeters was my unit there. And so if I go to divide that, I take 343.90 divided by 47.8. I'm going to get my answer of density of 7.19 uh, and the units then are grams over cubic centimeters or grams per cubic centimeter. And that's a typical uh, unit for a density anyway, grams per cubic centimeter. So 7.19 grams per cubic centimeter. Something that you might be asked to do then with that is, okay, if that's the, the measurement of mass and the volume that you came up with for this metal block, maybe they give you a list of possible identities of that metal now and say, okay, well, what kind of metal is it? What kind of metal is in that block? And you could go to the list of densities that are out there and figure out which metal has the density that's closest to 7.19. If you're curious, go look it up. You could go Google density of common metals um, or density of metal elements, and you'll find that there are probably, a, well, I can think of two or three that are pretty close to 7.19 in terms of the density, just of elements that are on our periodic table. And you'll probably find that there's one that's really close to that at 7.19. So take a look. I won't, I won't spoil it here, but see what you come up with. Last ones here for K and L um, are off of a burette. And so the difference is here that the numbering is upside down. Remember on a burette, the zero is up at the top and the usually a 50 is the, is the maximum on a burette. That's down at the bottom. So the numbering is sort of upside down, but you still read it the same way. We still read the lowest point of the meniscus. The gray here would represent our liquid that's in the, in the burette. And we need to decide, decide what are the lines on either side of the meniscus. So here's my low point in the meniscus there at the bottom of that curve. What are, the, what are the lines above it and below it? Well, this is 3.3, right? And this is 3.4. Now remember, I wanna make sure I pay attention. This is three, right? And this is four. If you just looked at the bottom number and you counted your way up, you might count up and say, this is 4.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4.6 and 4.7. And you'd be wrong because this isn't five up here at the top, right? This isn't a graduated cylinder, it's a burette. And you need to pay attention then to the major divisions to even kind of give yourself a chance to be correct. If this was a, a five up above, this would be a very different reading. But because it's a three and a four that we're in between, our, our measurement obviously needs to be between three and four, not between four and five. Right? So in this case, I'm between 3.3 and 3.4. I'm gonna say it's 3.3 something. And I think the bottom of that meniscus is just a little bit below halfway. So I'm gonna say it's a little closer to 3.4. So it's 3.36 for me. And again, two decimal places is the key. You might disagree with that last digit. The second reading here, same burette afterwards. So we've drained some liquid out of this. And I think the story here, the question says we've drained an acid uh, from, this, from this burette. And so now what's the reading afterwards? Well, again, this is 29.5. That's above the curve. This is 29.6 below the curve. So it's going to be 29.5 something. And I'm going to say that that's, again, just a whisker below the curve in the way that I'm seeing it. So I'm going to call that 29.56. That's the reading that I would take on that, on that burette at this point afterwards. So this is the before. And let's say that that's in milliliters. 
And this is the after the lab is done, after the experiment is complete, completed, and now there's that much in there. What we're really measuring in a burette is how much has been drained from the burette. So before we even started, we were at 3.36. And after we were done with the experiment, we had drained down to 29.56. The question at the very end then says, what was the volume that was used? So to go from 3.36 down to 29.56, how much acid had to have been drained right, from that burette? And it's just a difference between those two. So to get from 3.36 to 29.56, how much is the difference? I can just take those and subtract them. And really, it won't matter too much which way you subtract them in, in terms of order, because we drained a positive volume. You don't drain a negative amount, right? You can't have a negative volume. There's no such thing as a negative volume. Um, you can lose a positive amount, and that's what happened here. How much did we lose? If I subtract the old-fashioned way, this looks like 26.20 milliliters that were drained. 26.20 milliliters were used. And notice here, guys, because my, vol my values both had a 6 in the last place, maybe yours did, maybe yours didn't. Uh, when I go to subtract, my calculator would just say 26.2 because my calculator isn't as smart as I am. And the same thing's true for you and your calculator. In this case, because each of those volumes had a measurement to the nearest hundredth, your answer at the end should have a measurement to the nearest hundredth. Don't just get rid of this zero. In doing that, you're losing that precision of that hundredths place. 26.2 is not as precise as 26.20. They don't mean anything mathematically different, but this isn't just math. This is math put to use in a lab setting, and we call that science. So having that second decimal place there matters. 26.2 would not be okay. 26.20? Maybe you measured a little differently and you came up with 26.21 or 26.18. That's okay. Two decimal places in the end, though, is acceptable on all of those. There are some other questions for practice that we skipped. There are also some on the next page for measurement practice. I'd ask you to work on those uh, by the assigned due date, and we'll check them with the answer key at that time. Thanks for listening, and uh, if you have questions, make sure to connect with me and let me know how I can help. Thanks.